next is Lisa Bonnet from the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Program. We'll be talking about uh, MPAs and ecosystem based fisheries management. Thank you for the invite uh, today to the uh, symposium organizing, particularly Andre. I think I have him to thank for being here. Um, and uh, I, it's such an honor to be here and to see uh, a lot of the speakers and people present here today that have performed my uh, talk today, uh, my presentation. And as uh, Phil said, it's the topic is engaged as a tool for efficiency based social management and also sometimes on some issues of scale, perspective, and coordination. So I also took PowerPoint 101. Um, we'll be covering a couple of definitions. Um, I'll cover a national overview of MTAs. MTAs is a tool for EBSM. And then uh, going down in scale and focusing on uh, a website overview of MTAs. And then I'll um, uh, finish it up with the strategies for better integration and using uh, a promising example of the Monterey Bay National Sanctuary's um, MPA planning process to better um, integrate MPA with EBSM to better coordination with our partners. So you'll be hearing many definitions today of uh, EBSM. The one that I like is the one uh, by Morasco et al. In, um, which um, recognizes that there are many definitions with recurring themes. Um, EBSM is uh, interdisciplinary, it's uh, holistic, it's uh, specified geographically, that's what you have in common with NPA, because they're also specified geographically, space matters. Um, it considers interactions in the system, uh, trophic interactions, uh, interactions of users, not just fish, fishermen or fisheries, with the biophysical interactions. It, it really uh, advances this concept beyond single species management. Humans are an explicit part of the system, and it looks at the full range of ecosystem goods and services, and because it does that, um, it evaluates competing interests, and decisions need to be made um, concerning those competing interests. And so a quick uh, definition is uh, that EBSM recognizes the physical, biological, economic, and social interactions among the affected components of the ecosystem, and attempts to manage fisheries to achieve a stipulated spectrum of societal goals, some of which may be in competition. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that competition and a tool that we can use to better evaluate the strike trade off in different objectives for um, economies, um, ecosystems, and um, communities and management. So here is a, a wonderful um, perspective of EGFM. Um, advanced by Matt Boyd, and um, we already heard uh, Nate Rice talk about that it explicitly considers three elements, ecosystems, uh, socioeconomics or economies or communities, and management. That's where I sit in, um, in the whole plan. And uh, using this concept, sustainable fisheries is represented by the health of the interaction among the ecosystems, the socioeconomics or the economies, and management. And I consider EBM's role, not just EBSM's role, is to provide decision makers with the tools to weigh the competing objectives, mandates, and scientific, scientific perspectives, and to understand the relationship between ecosystems and people. Given that some decisions may have negative consequences, we can't always have a win-win situation, as Jake uh, pointed out, um, among the economies and um, ecosystems. Decisions need to be made regarding trade-offs among the desired goods and services of ecosystems and economies. And um, I'll be talking a little bit about integrated ecosystem assessment. That's not my forte. That's not what I work in. But we think that it will be a valuable tool as we move forward with our MTA planning process to afford exactly that purpose of evaluating trade-offs. So what are MPAs? MPAs are a management tool. They're not a process like EPFM. And um, they're a tool for managing human uses. They don't really manage ecosystems. They manage human uses of those human resources 
for the purpose of better conserving or protecting those marine resources or marine communities or ecosystems and ecosystem structure and function. Um, there are many terms that describe NPAs. We have underwater parks, marine managed areas, marine reserves. I mean, there are so many different terms and it can be quite confusing. Um, they've, been put, they've been put in place um, by, for, for many different purposes by hundreds of different agencies. And um, today there has been an ad hoc approach to marine protection in U.S. waters and with little comprehensive planning uh, for this space management tool for conservation, but just little comprehensive planning uh, for uh, using any type of spatial management tool, whether it's for conservation or not. So it's a general term that covers a range of place-based protection with little consistency or standardization among or within agencies and stakeholder groups. So confusion about, and particularly when NPA really exploded onto the scene. There was, and I still think that some confusion remains. And Executive Order 13158 on, um, on NPA issued in 2000 was um, issued exactly to address some of that confusion. Um, in part. It's also, its main goal is to enhance the management and conservation of marine resources to more effective and participatory uses of MPAs as an ecosystem tool. So there, you know, MPA is an ecosystem tool. The executive order has its own definition for what an MPA is. It's a very broad definition. It's any area of the marine environment that has been reserved by federal, state, territorial, tribal, or local laws or regulations to provide lasting protection for parts for part, for all of the natural and cultural resources there. So it also does cultural resource protection. Um, using this definition, uh, the NPA Center, which was established when the executive order was issued, has developed a national NPA inventory. And so using that definition, the um, partners of the NPA Center collected information on all of those sites that fit that in Missouri, and including information on um, the government ties with the state or federal entities that govern those MPAs, their level of protection, whether it's multiple use or no take, uh, the conservation focus, the permanency of protection or quantity of protection, and the establishment date. And so what you see on this map is the collection of the nation's MPA. The colors that you see here have, have no significance other than that we gave them all kinds of colors that you can see how many different ones are out there. And I hope that you can see from this map that there are a lot of MPAs out there and they cover a lot of areas um, across the nation. This uh, map provides a little bit more order because it looks at those MPAs according to their primary conservation focus. And looking at this map, we see that the uh, primary conservation focus can be natural heritage, and those are sites that were established as for biodiversity protection or ecosystem um, integrity or resilience protection. Um, and those are in red, and then we have the sustainable production sites, and those are classical fishery sites. And then where those sites overlap with each other, um, you'll see orange. And then there are also cultural heritage sites, as I um, mentioned earlier. But those tend to be shipwrecks, really small sites, and at this stage of scale, you won't see them. So what you can see from this map is that about 50% of all um, MPA area resides within um, fishery um, management zones. And the other um, half are within natural heritage. And so natural heritage sites are in red, and so natural heritage also covers the protection of um, endangered species. And so that's what you're seeing um, around Alaska. Those are the sort of sea lion sites. Along the east coast, those are um, large and whale whale um, uh, protection sites. The ones that are orange are the sustainable production sites. And um, I wanted to also mention that what you're seeing here are sites that are primarily managed by NOAA, either by National Fishery Service or by the organization that I work for, the Office of National Sanctuary. But it's primarily NOAA fisheries, either for ESA protection or for sustainable production purposes. And the, um, 
there are a lot more natural hairs in sight, um, but you can't see them on this map because they hug the coast. So there are a lot more natural hairs in sight by number, but the area that they cover is about the same as sustainable production sites, and sustainable production sites tend to be larger. And for those of you that have an eagle eye, um, um, Alaska, this map isn't completely correct because um, Alaska doesn't show the ESA series that were implemented. Um, I think in 2007, maybe 2006. So they showed that um, MPAs have been implemented for sustainable production reasons or potentially reasons, but not necessarily for EBFM. And um, because there are a lot more natural heritage sites, those natural heritage sites, because they're smaller, they seem to also not be very well integrated with EDSM because um, um, fisheries management tends to occur at a much larger scale, the scale of a large marine ecosystem, while those smaller natural heritage sites that you can't really see on the scale, they're much smaller. And there's a mismatch in scale of um, managing those MTAs and um, EDSM or fishing management. So a quick overview of uh, the national MTAs. There are about 1,700 of them currently. 90% uh, of them were established after 1970. The majority of uh, MTA area is multiple use, so not no take. So the flip side of that is that there uh, less than 1% is, is in no take area. And that's how much I think about, um, I wrote this down, 8,000 square kilometers in about 200 uh, different sites. The federal program, as I um, indicated earlier, manages more area while the state manages the greatest number. And the majority of MCAs have been implemented to be permanent for permanent reasons and year round. There are very few seasonal sites by number. So um, I wanted to see how have these MPAs, have they been really used as a tool for EBSM or can they be used as a tool for EBSM? And I used uh, this uh, paper, um, the Ten Commandments for EBS Scientists, which was a very interesting read. And I tried to see how well do these new uh, MPAs address these Ten Commandments. So the first one is keep a perspective that is holistic, risk averse, and adaptive. We well, yeah, actually do that particularly uh, because they're seen as a precautionary uh, tool in light of uh, some of the uncertainties in, in management or uncertainties about the science. Um, always ask key, uh, question key assumptions, well, that needs to be done for any tool. So I think there's a check mark there. Maintain old growth age structure and fish populations. Yes, MTA can do that, but plot limits can do that too. It's not the only tool. Characterize and maintain the natural spatial structure of fish stocks. Yes, um, there's a, an increasing realization that um, population structure is much uh, more complicated and on a smaller scale than we previously uh, realized, and we're realizing this through genetics and microchemistry. Uh, I mean, um, organic microchemistry, and um, MPA can help with um, maintaining some of that smaller scale population structure. Characterize and maintain viable fish habitats. That's what the DSA areas are for that have been implemented across the nation. Um, characterize and maintain ecosystem resilience. Yes, that's because um, having MPA can have areas where um, some components or some of Part of the um, ecosystem is um, better protected and there's higher bio biodiversity, which leads to more ecosystem resilience. Uh, again, two check marks. Identify and maintain critical food web connections. That's related to uh, number six. So I give that uh, two check marks as well. Account for ecosystem change through time. This is the uh, indication from as reference area, the research area, so that you can evaluate uh, changes of uh, the ecosystem through time or where you can evaluate the contribution of um, human-induced changes to the natural variation in the system. So again, uh, MPAs are a tool that could do that. 
a term for evolutionary change caused by fishing, that's number nine. There's some models that have indicated that fishing embryos can do that. And then lastly, implementing a approach that's integrated into interdisciplinary and inclusive. Well, that's what a lot of these people have been talking about today, and I don't think that it's just germane to MPA. So if we review this quickly, we see that seven out of ten commandments can be addressed in MPA. But I want to caution that MPAs are not the only tool. But they seem to be a pretty appropriate, robust, um, effective tool if they can address seven out of ten. But there are fishery concerns with MPAs. They're not the um, silver bullet. Um, the ones that are in dark, those are uh, ones that were, uh, those concerns were um, addressed in the paper by John Fields. Um, MPA, they um, introduce explicit spatial heterogeneity of population, which may complicate stock assessments. And that's what we need to inform our um, uh, conventional uh, fisheries. Uh, so, is the biomass on or off the table? Well, whether you can call it or off the table will um, tilt uh, the strategies towards either being risk averse or risk prone. Uh, the scale of MPA and the scale of traditional fishing management are not well mapped, as I tried to indicate with uh, the majority of MPAs are implemented on a much smaller scale than on um, which fisheries are managed. And then MPA restrictions may uh, impede long-term surveys critical stock assessments. As these MPAs are being implemented, they're in, um, in some instances, they are taking away those areas in which um, those um, fishery scientists are, are collecting their data. And the long-term surveys are informing not just fishery management, but also a lot of uh, management for conservation purposes. For example, the um, the program that I work for uses a lot of the fishing data to inform our management decisions. And then the, the ones that are light are not, um, they're not in light because they're not important, but those are ones that we heard from the beginning of um, MPA being counted as the tool that uh, their socioeconomic impact has not been well defined, particularly in terms of displaced efforts. Um, MPA benefits approved primarily to seven different species, and a lot of fisheries are focused on. Uh, highland migratory species. And this last one addresses that whole issue of win win. MPA results in lower yields overall. It's, we, can't, we cannot get away from that. So, quickly, how much time do I have? Try it. Okay, move on. Uh, so, another state of scale the state of the West Coast MPA. There are about 296 of them. They cover um, from shoreline out. They were implemented uh, by a combination of uh, different uh, uh, government types, federal, state, and partnerships. You can see that California has the vast majority of them um, on its coastline. Washington has fewer, and Oregon has the least. Um, and then, this is my one cool graphic. Um, the recent addition of EFA sites changed the marine landscape of place safe management tremendously. And this all happened in 2006. So that's what it looks like now. And this is what it looked like in 2006. And the majority of MPA um, uh, area was sited within uh, national sanctuaries. And the um, we went from 47% of West Coast waters being covered by MPAs um, from um, EFA. Uh, I'm sorry. We went from 6% in 2006 being covered by MPAs to 47% just by the designation of the EFA areas. Um, I'll just get to that. Get to that one. I wanted to just quickly show this one. Uh, the first slide that I showed you about uh, conservation focus addressed the primary conservation focus, but we realized that um, most um, purposes for MPAs are a combination of uh, those conservation foci. So um, the, natural, the EFA areas are for sustainable production purposes, but they're also for um, protection of um, the um, habitat, so they also address um, <coughs> national heritage purposes. And off of our coast, 
because the DSA period dominates the MTA um, scene, um, they occupy the largest area. So in some ways, this is a this is a form of DDSM, but addressing just one commandment of uh, uh, the ten commandments does not constitute EDSM. One would be excommunicated if one mm -hmm. addresses the other. So go to that. Um, almost half the West Coast waters are in MTAs. The overwhelming majority are mostly youth. Uh, less than one percent is home safe, but that is changing rapidly, primarily because of California marching through its MLPA process. Um, no take MPAs are primarily managed by states and they're small, and the largest MPAs are federally managed with full conservation focus. That's the 51 in that regard. It's the notion that the MPA terms that I was talking about. So, um, I, I have to just go through this quickly because I wanted to um, I'll skip this. So, um, we um, at we are taking the Monterey Bay National Sanctuary's um, MPA planning process as an opportunity to better integrate MPAs with um, ecosystem-based fishing management. Um, the superintendent made the decision that uh, the sanctuary would move forward with considering MPAs, um, and since then, and it's been about a year ago. The sanctuary has been spending time trying to figure out how can we do this better? How can we learn from what happens with Channel Islands or with the um, Florida Keys? How can we better integrate and how can we better um, collaborate with each other? So one, these are some of the principles that we're using uh, of interagency collaboration, early and frequent communication to identify some of our complementary needs. And when I say complementary needs, we realize that our MTA planning process might be an opportunity for us to better integrate with the ESA five-year review, or to work with the council on their efforts to um, to develop an ecosystem fishing management plan, or to integrate better with the West Coast Governance Agreement. And just recently, some of the NGOs have approached us with uh, developing community fishing associations. Uh, because of the ITP process that is unfolding off of our coast. Uh, another principle is to use the best available science, and with that we would really like to use an IEA, but not just any IEA, we would like to be doing it collaboratively with our partners, with NOAA Fisheries, and with the Pacific Fishery, Fishery Management Council on the state. And to do a collaborative IEA, we realize that we have to really address the issue of scale, so that we can have better matches of economy, governance, and uh, ecosystem, and so that we hope that this IEA can help us identify some complementary issues and evaluate trade-offs, but also help us as a sanctuary develop some um, um, assessment criteria. We need stakeholder participation to do this, as with any uh, spatial planning process, and we are committed to using the NECA process. And not just using NEPA to avoid some um, lawsuits at the end, but using NEPA <laughs> to, um, to really focus on the interagency collaboration so that we can avoid the train wreck that we have seen um, play out time after time. And then um, we're really focusing on collaboration and integration. Uh, we want to determine the key ecosystem issues and uses to evaluate trade-offs and to do some cost-benefit analysis. Uh, we need to identify the appropriate spatial scale for IEA. There's this idea of using the um, California current marginal ecosystem and nested in within that smaller IEA that would um, address some of the sanctuaries, the Monterey Bay National Sanctuaries, MPA needs. But maybe within the West Coast um, model, the uh, large marine ecosystem, we can use sanctuaries as sentinel sites, not just our sanctuary, but the five sanctuaries that we find along our coast. It's very important to uh, develop um, appropriate indicators and to evaluate the relationships between uh, pressures and status, and to include public participation and peer review. And what we're hoping to do is to share our communication plan with our 
partners so that we can, with one voice, communicate to our stakeholders and we feel that we owe it to them so that we can reduce the confusion with all of these planning efforts that are unfolding on our coast. And hopefully through this effort, we can um, offer something to the stakeholders that is a, a combined process rather than a process that's unfolding in series, in series or in parallel. And that's it. I hope I we do have time for, uh, for a question. Okay. Yeah, the, the line map that you showed was uh, if I was a Congress member and I looked at that map, uh, and the director of the U.S., I would say, we're about this cover. Um, so I'm wondering, has there been any, any attempt with Okay, so the first part, um, the gap analysis, several um, entities, like several um, NGOs have done gap analysis, I think the TNC has done several of them, um, in different regions. And the MPA Center is now in the process of doing gap analysis and <laughs> addressing exactly that need. And then uh, there have been several efforts in the way, not necessarily by the government, uh, if you look at these upwelling fronts, I can think of the Baja to Bering um, effort that is looking at um, some of these upwelling fronts as areas to be protected and that are dynamic. And um, on that, um, as part of that database, there are spatial tools or place-based management that is used, MTAs you could call them, that move. I can think of the ones that, they are, that are implemented off of uh, New England to protect the um, white whale. They're called SAM or SAM. Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you. So they're already being used, but unfortunately because of the way this uh, definition was developed for um, MPA for that national database, SAM didn't um, meet the definition. But I think for any spatial planning effort, you should look at use that inventory, that's a good starting point, but you should also look at all the other spatial management efforts or tools that are out there that didn't make that cut because they should still be considered. Like the RCA is not part of the database, but they should be part of any um, gap analysis or spatial planning efforts. Does that answer your question? Well, thank you. Thank you.